to be presenting this information to you. Uh, a lot of this is really kind of cutting edge, and I, I don't think that you're gonna you're gonna get this information in very many places. So, you know, when I learned it, I felt a real responsibility to share this because it's something that is um, it's it's quite a burden. And I know a lot of people are nervous about it, and and I just want to clear some things up and provide a little hope. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started again. You know, thanks a bunch for coming. So the title of the talk is, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia. Can they be reversed? I'm going to propose to you that the things that you've heard, there's no cure. There's no prevention. There's nothing that anybody can do. I'm gonna I'm gonna posit that that is not correct. Okay, so that's kind of the, the point of my talk. Like I said, give you guys some hope and show you some things that have been shown, they're published, they're working. Okay, so we'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of this is really cutting edge, and it's pretty dense material. Um, I won't say that I watered it down because I didn't, but what I did do is I, I focused on things that are, that are practical and applicable, and I left a lot of the biochemistry and physiology out of it, okay? So um, you can thank me for that later. <laughs> all right, so first of all, I wanna give you guys just a little bit of perspective on the organ that we're talking about, which is our brain. So our brain, only makes up 2% of our body weight, but it uses one-fourth of our daily energy, okay? So this is a relatively small organ that is very demanding, and another interesting point about it is it's not like our muscles that store glycogen, it's not like some of our organs that store energy as fat. Our brain does not store any energy. So every millisecond of every day, your body is working diligently to feed your brain. And it's actually kind of interesting, with a normal birth, the reason that the birth happens is the fetus's brain gets too hungry for mom to feed. So amazing, amazing tissue. As our population ages, the number is expected to grow significantly. So they're, they're projecting 13 million people by 2050, which is right around the corner. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that the impact is much, much greater than that 5.5 million people who are suffering because Alzheimer's disease is such a hard thing for families to go through. Uh, I think it's almost as hard, if not harder, for the people around the patient as it is for the patient themselves. Uh, it's really, really just a cruel thing and, and it really puts a strain on people. Uh, so for future reference, when you guys see this abbreviation AD, that's, that's Alzheimer's disease. So I, I abbreviated it throughout the PowerPoint. So another interesting uh, factor is that women are really at the epicenter of this <coughs> crisis. Um, almost two-thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women, and again, almost two-thirds of caregivers are, are women. So on either side of, of the spectrum, you have a, a really strong impact on, on the ladies in this country. The, today, the, a lady's chance of developing Alzheimer's disease is greater than their chance of developing breast cancer. So it's, it's something that's definitely at the front of our mind as far as public health. So here's a map just to kind of let you guys know uh, worldwide what the effect is. Um, all the countries that you see in red here, bless you, all the countries you see in red here have high incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and then as we go down, green, purple, gray, lower and lower. So can anybody tell me what runs in common between all of the red countries on this on this map any ideas anything is is appropriate what do you guys think what do they have in common well 
They're all rich countries. They're all developed countries. Um, one thing I want to point out, India is low incidence. Okay, so just keep that in mind. We're going to kind of touch, touch on this towards the end of the presentation, but I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Very low incidence in India. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, you know, not a lot of promise for treatment. Um, we've spent untold billions of dollars researching Alzheimer's disease, and there has been absolutely nothing that has been shown to make any significant improvement. And my question is, why? Right? So I'm a why guy. I'm always asking why. I would theorize that it's because they're using the wrong approach. There's no magic bullet <coughs> for Alzheimer's disease. There's no one thing that's just going to cure it and be done with it. And this is like many diseases that we see. They're just too complicated for one pill to solve, okay? So this is what the ideal Alzheimer's drug would do. These are all the actions that one little pill would have to cover. And as you can see, this is quite a mouthful, okay? It's a very complex condition and it just can't be solved with, with the one pill solution. I would, I would propose that there will never be a drug that cures Alzheimer's, because it's too complicated. But I do have some good news, okay? So they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time researching Alzheimer's disease, and what they've been able to do is identify some targets for treatment, which are basically precipitating factors, uh, things that happen in your body that bring it about. They know pretty well why it happens, but they haven't been able to come up with a drug to fix that. Okay? And that's kind of what we're going over today. So if there's no magic bullet, then why don't we try a shotgun approach? Right? Professionally, we call this combination therapy. So combination therapy is shown to be really effective um, in treating HIV, uh, certain types of cancers, some of the more difficult to treat diseases, they're using combination therapy and they've had some success. Okay, so that's kind of what this talk is all about. So I want you guys to kind of think of it this way. Alzheimer's disease is like a roof with 36 different holes in it. Okay, and you know the rain's coming, you want to stay dry, you're going to have to plug some holes in this roof. But I'm going to tell you guys that you don't have to plug every single one of them to stay dry. You just have to hit enough to give you that cover, okay? So here we have uh, Dr. Bredesen. I'm going to let him introduce himself. My presentation today is based largely upon research that he did uh, on Alzheimer's disease. He is a senior researcher at UCLA and he has been working on aging and brain health for more or less his whole career. So we're just going to take a quick minute to uh, let him introduce himself. Uh, my name is Dale Bredesen, and I am at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. So two things. Uh, one, when I was a freshman uh, in college, uh, I read a book called The Machinery of the Brain by Dean Wooldridge, and it compared the brain to fascinated by that, and so I got interested in the brain, and uh, when I started doing research, I was interested in what causes brain cells to commit suicide, so why is there neural cell death, um, how does this happen, what are the genes involved, and the uh, regulatory proteins, etc., and as we started to look through specific gene products that had effect on neuronal survival and neuronal death, we started noticing that some of these seem to be important molecules in Alzheimer's disease. So we wanted to know if the fundamental program cell death pathways had a relationship to what's actually going on in Alzheimer's disease. Um, my answer is 
answer is that uh, President Obama has, uh, has suggested that we should have something that's uh, significantly beneficial by 2025. But I think as a community of uh, biomedical researchers, we will beat that significantly. Uh, because I think that we have new approaches uh, that have not been tried before that look, uh, I think we'll look at the biology of it differently than we've looked at before. And I think uh, for the first uh, now 109 years uh, uh, since uh, the original discovery, of, sorry, 107 years since the first description, uh, we really haven't had much that helps the disease. But I think that we're seeing uh, very different approaches. Uh, and uh, in our case, we believe that, uh, that specific combinations of therapies, um, which of course is what worked much better in HIV than monotherapies, and of course also has worked much better in cancer than monotherapies. Um, we, we believe that that sort of approach will ultimately be the optimal one in Alzheimer's as well. And there's been very, very little work in this area. Obama's goal of, of having something by 2025 and he mentioned a couple times the new approaches and the combination therapies so that's exactly what we're going over today in this presentation is that autoplay on YouTube okay so as I mentioned um, you know we have a different approach Okay, so this is the this is the paper that uh, Dr. Bredesen published in September of 2014, and it basically outlines the things that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Okay, this was a follow-up paper uh, published in June of 2016. So this is this is hot off the presses. I mean, this is really cutting-edge research, and I'm so excited to bring it to you guys today. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of what to do, I want to clear up some things uh, regarding memory. So there are certain types of memory loss that are considered normal, okay? So we're going to go over some normals, and then we'll go over some things to watch out for. So first of all, we have uh, transients. We've all experienced this. It's been long enough that you forget, okay? Use it or lose it. And this is actually considered beneficial. It clears out old memories to make room for new ones, all right? So also normal is absent-mindedness. You're not paying close enough attention when you set your keys down, or your glasses, or your wallet, and you don't remember where that is, okay? So this is considered normal, all right? Uh, blocking, I know that probably everyone in this room has gone through this. It's when you, you're trying to bring it up, and it's right on the tip of your tongue, and you just can't get the word out. That could be a name, a number. That's normal, okay? It happens and it's normal. Uh, we also have misattribution. <clears throat> That's, you remember something correctly, but one of the details you miss out on, okay? Maybe you remember the event, but it was the wrong year, or things like that, okay? So that's also normal. Finally, we have uh, suggestibility, which is you learn something after the event happens and you incorporate that knowledge into the memory. Okay, so this is something you learn after the fact that gets mixed in with the original memory and it, it's a little bit hazy, okay? So that's normal too. Uh, finally, we have bias. And the best way I can explain this is you don't remember right because you don't want to. There's something, you have a belief about something or an experience, positive or negative, that prevents you from remembering accurately, okay? So these are all normal types of forgetfulness. So for example, it's not Alzheimer's or dementia when you forget where your keys are. Or when you forget someone you just met, you forget their name. Or if you forget an appointment, okay, that's, that's considered normal. It might be Alzheimer's or dementia if you're driving around your neighborhood and you can't remember where your house is. Or if you start to forget the names of people that you've known forever. Or you have bills that don't get paid. Life skills that start to deteriorate. In the paper that, that Dr. Bredesen published, 
there was a great example of this. Gentleman, his whole life had been good with numbers, and he was able to add multiple columns of numbers in his head like that. So suddenly he starts to lose this ability. That's the kind of life skill that when that starts to degrade, then you start to wonder, well, maybe this is dementia, okay? And, and incidentally, I want to mention that sometimes um, through good intentions, our families can actually interfere with uh, an early diagnosis. And, and I'll explain that because, um, you know, say, you know, mom, mom's just getting older and she needs some help paying bills. She's missed a few bills, she's just getting older, uh, we're going to step in and help. Or, you know, you have friends and family members that do things to ease the burden on you and help you to adapt, okay? So, this great intentions, but I just want you guys to recognize that some of these can be warning signs, okay? So, some early symptoms, difficulty remembering names, these would be names of family members, close friends neighbors that you've lived next to for years and years. Um, you forget events or recent conversations. If you're apathetic or depressed, and this is something that is just kind of come about, that can be an indicator that, you know, something's not quite right up here. Um, and also wanted to mention that if, if you have a history of depression, then you're at an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, the, the explanation for that link is not well known at this point but they know that the link is there, okay? So something to kind of watch out for. So we're gonna do another little video. Uh, I had a hard time deciding where to put this video in the presentation um, because it's gonna apply later on in the talk when we talk about heavy metals. But I think it really provides a nice visual of what's actually going on at a cellular level when we're talking about Alzheimer's. And you know the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if a picture's worth a thousand, then a video, you know, you just go with that. So we're going to watch this. It's about four and a half minutes, uh, but it really is going to set the stage for a little understanding of what's going on. <laughs> toxic substance, whether it is inhaled or consumed in the diet as a food contaminant. Over the past 15 years, medical research laboratories have established that dental amalgam tooth fillings are a major contributor to mercury body burden. In 1997, a team of research scientists demonstrated that mercury vapor inhalation by animals produced a molecular lesion in brain protein metabolism, which was similar to a lesion seen in 80% of Alzheimer's diseased brains. Recently completed experiments by scientists at the University of Calgary's Faculty of Medicine now reveal, with direct visual evidence from brain neuron tissue cultures, how mercury ions actually alter the cell membrane structure of developing neurons. To better understand mercury's effect on the brain, let us first illustrate what brain neurons look like and how they grow. In this animation, we see three brain neurons growing in a tissue culture each with a central cell body and numerous neurite processes. At the end of each neurite is a growth cone where structural proteins are assembled to form the cell membrane. Two principal proteins involved in growth cone function are actin, which is responsible for the pulsating motion seen here, and tubulin, a major structural component of the neurite membrane. During normal cell growth, Tubulin molecules link together end to end to form microtubules which surround neurofibrils, another structural protein component of the neuronal axon. Shown here is the neurite of a live neuron isolated from snail brain tissue, displaying linear growth due to growth cone activity. It is important to note that growth cones in all animal species, ranging from snails to humans, have identical structural and behavioral characteristics and use proteins of virtually identical composition. In this experiment, neurons also isolated from snail brain tissue were grown in culture for several days, after which very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibrils seen here. 
In contrast, other heavy metals added at this same concentration, such as aluminum, lead, cadmium, and manganese, did not produce this effect. To understand how mercury causes this degeneration, let us return to our illustration. As mentioned before, tubulin proteins link together during normal cell growth to form the microtubules which support the neurite structure. When mercury ions are introduced into the culture medium, they infiltrate the cell and bind themselves to newly synthesized tubulin molecules. More specifically, the mercury ions attach themselves to the binding site reserved for guanosine triphosphate, or GTP, on the beta subunit of the affected tubulin molecules. Since bound GTP normally provides the energy which allows tubulin molecules to attach to one another, mercury ions bound to these sites prevent tubulin proteins from linking together. Consequently, the neurite's microtubules begin to disassemble into free tubulin molecules, leaving the neurite stripped of its supporting structure. Ultimately, both the developing neurite and its growth cone collapse, and some denuded neurofibrils form aggregates or tangles, as depicted here. Shown here is a neurite growth cone stained specifically for tubulin and actin, before and after mercury exposure. Note that the mercury has caused disintegration of tubulin microtubule structure. These new findings reveal important visual evidence as to how mercury causes neurodegeneration. More importantly, the study provides the first direct evidence that low-level mercury exposure is indeed a precipitating factor that can initiate this neurodegenerative process within the brain. actually happening when we're learning and when we're advancing those processes that you're seeing on the film there with the neurons growing and you know pulsing that's happening right now I'm teaching you guys something I'm learning something this is this is an ongoing process okay and so when we have Alzheimer's patients the growth that is supposed to be continual and regenerative, it starts to break down. And at the end of the video where they talked about the, the naked fibers that started to tangle up, when you hear about Alzheimer's and you read about Alzheimer's, you'll, you'll hear them talking about uh, neuro tangles. That, that's what they're talking about. It's like, the, it's like the train track without the tunnel for the train to go through. Okay, so it's, it's really a nice, nice little visual for everybody and I think we can kind of move forward um, with a little better understanding. So I'm going to talk to you guys about some potential risk factors. Uh, I get asked the question all the time, is it genetic? And, and my answer to that is there are some genes that have been identified that will <coughs> precipitate or will indicate that you have some kind of a predisposition to Alzheimer's, um, but I'm also going to show you that our genes are not our destiny, okay? So this is one that's really important. It's the APOE gene. This gene codes for uh, multiple processes in our body, but they have found that it's very important in Alzheimer's disease, okay? So there's three, three forms of the gene. You inherit one copy from each parent, okay? So each have two copies of this gene. And they're down here, E2, E3, or E4. So E2 is the least common. 10% of people have this one. Uh, E3 is the most common. Almost two-thirds of people have two copies. So they consider this one to be neutral. Now this is the one that really uh, kind of needs to be addressed a little bit. The E4, 14% of the population has this. And 2% of the population got a copy from each parent. So they have two copies of this, okay? So the, the risk factor as far as genetics are concerned, if you have A2, then you might be at a lower risk. If you have one copy of E4, then it increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease about threefold. If you have two copies, it increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's eight to 12 fold. Okay, so this is something that's very uh, predictive.
So you're probably asking yourself, if it's so important, then why have I not been tested, or why have I never heard about the test for this? And the answer is in good intentions, okay? So the old way of thinking was, like I said before, there's no way to prevent Alzheimer's, there's no way to treat it, and if you get it, there's nothing that can be done. So your doctor says, why would I test somebody if they come up positive, then they're going to worry themselves sick about it. And if we can't do anything about it, then why would we want them to worry? So it goes back to the doctor, first of all, does no harm, right? So I'm going to tell you guys that we can do something. This is Dr. Bredesen's second paper, the one that was published in June that I referenced earlier. Everyone in the study had the APOE4 gene, okay? Five people had two copies. And I like this line here. The magnitude of improvement is unprecedented. They've never seen improvement like this in Alzheimer's. <clears throat> this is another uh, excerpt from that paper. And Dr. Bredesen basically says that the old way of thinking is that there's nothing we can do and that doctors never tested people. But I love, I love this right here. The examples described here complement and extend previously published data that argue that these claims are no longer valid. So the idea that there's nothing that can be done is a idea that's been invalidated. Okay? Given the success of the therapeutic regimen, it may be appropriate to evaluate these genes as part of prevention and early reversal. Early identification and treatment could potentially have a major impact on the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. So what Dr. Bredesen is saying is if we accept the new way of thinking that has been proven to be correct, then we can make a big difference in the rate of Alzheimer's disease in this country. Because like so many things, if we catch it early, we're on the right side of the curve, okay? So, I said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again, your genes are not your destiny, okay? They can influence your life, but they are not your destiny, okay? So, you know, they can help us to identify some priorities, some things that we really need to watch for, okay? And maybe some things that we want to do preventatively before we show up with these conditions. Um, I use this 23andMe, that, I have no affiliation with any of these companies, but that's a, a well-advertised genetic testing company and you know the, the test for a patient I think is about $150, okay? So moving on from genetics, we're going to talk about some more risk factors. Uh, major, major risk factor is uh, type 2 diabetes, okay? If you have type 2 diabetes, you're twice as likely to get Alzheimer's. And if you're a diabetic on insulin, you're four times as likely to get Alzheimer's. Now, I want to point out that insulin is considered the most inflammatory biomolecule. So yes, our bodies make it, but yes, it is also very, very destructive, especially at the levels that people get in insulin injections. Really hard on us, okay? So the good news about this is I think of type 2 diabetes as low-hanging fruit. This is something that might not be easy, but it's very simple to correct. And, and we do it all the time. We help people with diabetes all the time. Get out, get moving, get your diet right. Everybody's heard all these things. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying that it's very straightforward, okay? So this is, you know, an, an example. We, we do things in the office, you know, 10 day, 10 day blood sugar program. I mean, you can do anything for 10 days. We'll talk about another uh, biggie as far as risk factors, and that's neuroinflammation. So what do I mean when I say that? I mean inflammation in your brain. And there are some direct causes like these. Neurotoxins, you know, we saw the video with the mercury destroying the brain neuron, uh, heavy metals, chemicals, drugs. You can have pathogens. These are uh, basically critters, bacteria, viruses, yeast, parasites. 
they can cause inflammation. A big one is uh, mouth infections, sinus infections. If you're chronically fighting a virus, like Epstein-Barr virus is a big one. If you're chronically battling something, then your body wears itself out eventually. Um, you can have trauma, you know, a, a blow to the head, or um, you know, vascular, it says vascular there, that would be like a stroke, or a mini stroke. And I know you guys have all heard about the things that are coming out with NFL players and the health of their brains. That's, that's what we're talking about, blows to the head. Autoimmunity, that's when your body is attacking itself and it sees things that are your own organs as foreign and it starts to attack them. Um, big issue with that that's underreported is gluten sensitivity. <coughs> that would be a big driver. Um, also, we have aging. Uh, you know, our processes, they start to break down as we get older. That's just how, that's just how life is. Um, and also genetics, you know, we touched on that a little bit before. So here's some kind of different, we're going to break it down a little farther. Uh, you can have oxidative stress, which is damage from free radicals. These come from things like sleep apnea, smoking, um, high iron in your blood is very damaging and it's a very simple fix if you have high iron then you donate blood there you go um you in, don't donate in, blood donate blood you got too much iron and so you're going to just give some away infections and then we have these inflammatory cytokines these are like the signalers they're like the scouts that go ahead of the army check things out and then if they need to, they call in the cavalry, okay? So these are all natural processes that are good, but when they break down and when they're overwhelmed, then it starts to cause problems. So we have obesity, insulin we already covered, um, excessive exercise, you know, the people that are doing Ironman triathlons two, three times a year and training like that, they're putting themselves through some serious, serious strain, okay? And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Again infections. So then you have danger signaling, which is like a direct cause and effect, and this comes from damage <coughs> tissue. It could be burns, bruises, broken bones, infections. You guys kind of seeing a little bit of a theme as far as things that are putting a strain on us. Um, infections are really important. So kind of mention this. These are our alarm systems. They're good. You know, if you have a house, then you want a smoke alarm. It warns you when there's a fire. But what if you're just a bad cook and you got a little smoke coming out of the oven? Then your alarm goes off and it goes off and it goes off. And if your alarm's going off every night when you cook, then what happens, right? It, it makes us crazy. <laughs> and so that's kind of what happens in our body. These are all processes that are put there to really help us and they enable us to survive but when they start to go haywire, then we start to have some damage, okay? So I know you guys have bared with me through all the risk factors and some of this stuff that might be a little bit uh, jargon-filled, and, and you want to know what to do about it. And so we're going to kind of get down to the nuts and bolts here, okay? Thankfully, it's fairly simple. Like I said, not necessarily easy, but it is fairly simple, okay? So again, I'm going to reiterate that I'm going to go over a lot of things here. They don't apply to everybody. Everybody's different. Every case is unique. And so that's where you have a guy like me who's a detective and says, okay, what applies to this particular person? What are the burdens in their life? And what can we work on? Okay, so we're going to cover a lot of things here, but I want you guys to know that not every person is going to have to do everything. All right? So first and foremost, we've got to, got to, got to get inflammation under control, okay? We've gone over a few things that can cause that. Blood sugar, uh, leaky gut, chronic allergies, infections, chemicals, stress. So that's where the detective work comes in. You say, what's causing the inflammation? And, and we fix it, okay? So like I said, not all these things apply to every person, okay? Got to get to the cause. 
All right, so the second thing that we need to do is balance our hormones, okay? I didn't spend a lot of time on this as far as risk factors. You, you have to kind of uh, condense some of this material for time's sake, but um, thyroid hormones are very important. And I can tell you that 99 times out of 100, Synthroid is not the answer, okay? It's much deeper than that. And like I said before, we're always trying to get to the root. The root, the root, the root. What is the farthest upstream we can go to solve these problems? Is Synthroid a drug? Synthroid's a synthetic hormone, and it is a downstream treatment. So it doesn't do anything for the cause, it just helps with the lab numbers, basically. Um, the third one, and this is a big one, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this one, is sleep. We have to, have to, have to get sleep. That is our body's time to repair, to regenerate, to revitalize. Our, our brain clean themselves out when we're sleeping. And this is brand new, brand new discovery. Um, when, when we're sleeping, our brains have a little extra room, right? They're not doing so much. They're not keeping us awake. We're not thinking. And so when we sleep, our brains have time to go in and uh, clear out some of the junk that's accumulated, and it is so important. I can't emphasize it enough. So some issues with sleep, sleep-wake <coughs> issues, sleep apnea. Um, if you're taking frequent naps and you're, you're messing with your rhythms, um, insomnia, you just don't sleep. Sleep deprivation, I think any of us here who've ever missed a night's sleep know what your brain feels like the next day. It's really hard on us to not get sleep. Um, on the bottom here we have sleep quality. Some people call that sleep efficiency. That's the time in bed versus the actual time sleeping. Okay, So just because you go to bed at 8, like me, doesn't mean that you fall asleep <laughs> at 8, right? So sleep hygiene. Here's some important points on sleep hygiene. You gotta have a routine. You gotta get up in the morning at the same time, you gotta go to bed at the same time. And I don't mean by the minute, but if you're going to bed at night sometimes at 2 a.m. and you're going to bed at night other times at 10 p.m., you're, you're messing with your body's rhythms, okay? If anybody's ever worked a swing shift, they know how hard it is. It is really tough on your biological clock. Um, I kind of touched on it before, we wanna avoid naps. Okay, you should be sleeping at night. That's when everybody sleeps. That's when we're supposed to sleep. The room has to be dark. And maybe your room can't be dark enough. That's where a sleeping mask comes in, okay? Um, it has to be quiet. Maybe you live in a noisy neighborhood. I would recommend getting some earplugs. You know, if you have uh, a home environment that's not the quietest, then don't feel bad about putting in some earplugs. You, you have to guard your sleep like it's the most precious treasure, okay? I can't emphasize it enough. Um, you gotta avoid blue light. By blue light, I mean tablets, iPads, iPhones, cell phones, laptops, electronics, TV, okay? So what the blue light does is it stimulates your body to wake up. That's the same light that you get in the morning, and so you're looking at a, at a screen on your technology and it's telling your brain, wake up, wake up, wake up. Makes it really hard to sleep, okay? One thing I include, and it, it just drives me up the wall, Mercy can tell you, the blinky lights from everything. LEDs are very cheap and the engineers put them in everything and even if your device is um, powered off or sleep mode, Chances are there's some kind of blinking light. There's little LED lights everywhere. So just make it your mission to have the darkest, most electronic free room. Turn your alarm clock so that it doesn't face your bed. Um, you, you've got to avoid these lights, okay? Another point is your room has to be cool and comfortable. Okay, I know in El Paso that's not always the easiest thing, especially in the middle of August but we gotta try to have a cool room with warm feet. Okay, if your feet are cold, put some socks on. Put some booties on, wear a onesie. Whatever you gotta do 
to be comfortable and let your body get that <coughs> time to regenerate. It is so, so important. So uh, I'm going to kind of take a minute to talk about uh, benzos. And I say benzo because that's kind of the common ab abbreviation. I'm talking about a class of drugs, uh, benzodiazepines. These are uh, some of the classics, Valium, Xanax, uh, Lorazepam. These are antidepressants, sleeping pills, things like that. Um, never personally experienced them, but I know for people I knew in college, um, a Friday night with a couple Xanax was a great time. And if you have a prescription for these, then good or bad, this is a very valuable prescription. Uh, a lot of potential for abuse, and I'm going to... I'm going to propose to you that there are better options, okay? One of the reasons that this comes up is because people take these to help them sleep, right? And, and so if you're taking this to help you sleep, but it's increasing your risk of Alzheimer's disease, then what's the point, okay? I think it's interesting in this study, they, they talk about uh, long-term exposure. They classified that as... 180 doses and the interesting thing was it didn't matter if you took one a day for six months or you took 180 over five years your risk elevation was the same okay and they use some pretty strong language in here unwarranted long-term use of these drugs should be considered as a public health concern how I have, long can you be on I mean I, well I have patients that have been on uh, some of these drugs for 10 years plus, every night. And so I would argue that that is much higher than the 180 total doses that's in this paper. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's just, um, you know, like I said in the beginning, just like our genes don't uh, control our destiny. Things that we've done in the past don't necessarily control our destiny. It's all about what we're, what we're going to do from here. What do we do now that we know, right? But the, 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 their definition of long-term use was 180 doses. So that would be one a night for six months. Which doesn't sound like very long, especially when you consider, like I said, I have patients who have been on these kinds of drugs for 10 or 20 years, okay? They, they are really some nasty, nasty pills. Mm -hmm. And then to compound the issue, there are natural choices that are much better. Here's a study that I love. Um, they compared valerian, which is a tried and true herbal sleep aid. They compared valerian head to head with Ambien and it was just as effective. It wasn't better, it was just as effective, but there were no side effects. And then over here, another study that I really like, uh, combines kava and valerian to help people sleep. This one here on, the, on, on this study, they used valerian to help people sleep as they were going through withdrawals from long-term use of these drugs. And so there's some really fantastic natural solutions to some of these common problems and I'm so excited to bring these to you today. And it just gets better from here, okay? Um, fourth thing we have to do for Alzheimer's disease, we have to manage stress. And I know you've heard it before, you gotta watch your stress, you gotta watch your stress. Like many conditions, Alzheimer's is no different. We really have to manage our stress levels. There's some really cool natural things we can do for this too. Exercise, meditation, prayerful moments, you know, whatever, whatever you do to decompress is fantastic. And then we also have some nice herbs to help us out too. And, and I'm not talking about like Colorado herbs. These are, these are different than that, okay? So, um, Kava Forte is one of my favorites. Um, Kava Kava is a, is a root that they've been using in the South Pacific to help people relax for, since there have been people down there, okay? Fifth thing, we've got to manage our dental health. We've got to watch our teeth. 
You know, I, I mentioned over and over and over infections, infections, infections. One of the most common places where people have a long-standing infection is in their mouth. Okay? Uh, by age 60, most people have lost one-third of their teeth. By age 80, almost half of people don't have any teeth at all. Okay? This is a number that I really am kind of focused on. 50% of people older than 55 have periodontitis. Now, what does that word mean? That means you have a mouth infection. Gum infection, teeth infection, you have a mouth infection. So, half of people over 55 have some kind of long-standing mouth infection. So, this is a really important thing to cut down on. We can help with you. We can help you with that too. And this is something that I learned about very recently. Um, this is Dr. Ellie Phillips. She's a dentist in Austin. She spent her time practicing with special populations. People with dementia, people with mental retardation, people who had had uh, strokes and couldn't physically brush their teeth. And she came up with this system, which incidentally is our giveaway today. We're going to give one of these away today for you guys. I feel so strongly about this. Um, she took things that you can buy at Walgreens, that's one reason I love this system so much. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing prescription. This stuff is at Walgreens. It's just how you use it. And she has a very specific way that you use this system, and you can completely change your dental outlook. Okay, so this is really important. If you guys want any information on this, if you don't win the raffle tonight, that's fine. Come talk to me. I'd love to tell you about this. So the sixth thing we need to do is we need to manage our nutrition and we do that with supplements and herbs. Okay, so diet is great. Sometimes when we're up against a major uh, crisis like Alzheimer's disease, we need a little more juice. Okay, and that's kind of where the supplements come in. Um, some really important vitamins and minerals uh, with regards to Alzheimer's, B vitamins, uh, cysteine is an amino acid. Coconut oil or, or MCT, which is um, a little more specialized coconut oil. We got fish oil. You know, remember that your brain is 60% fat. And so you, you have to feed yourself these things to give yourself the building blocks to rebuild your brain. So one thing, we've got some samples. I've got my calamari oil out there. It is dynamite brain food. Okay? These are all herbs. And we're going to talk about them. This one's really interesting. Zinc-copper ratio. So, you know, we have copper pipes. We have copper wiring. We run into copper in a lot of places. And copper is very destructive to our nervous system. But thankfully, zinc protects us from that. So if we have adequate zinc levels, then it mitigates some of the damage done by too much copper. It kind of cancels things out. CoQ10, this is a big one. People always know about CoQ10 for heart health, but it's also really important in brain health. And then we have these two vitamins, vitamin D and vitamin K2. So as, as kind of a little bonus, does anybody know where we get vitamin K2? <coughs> Leafy green vegetables. Pretty much anything that's good for you will have vitamin K2. All right, one thing that I, that I think people don't realize a lot of times is that a lot of medicines that people take actually deplete you of vitamins. And one of the big ones that I think is really relevant to this talk is uh, metformin. So we know that diabetes is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and that blood sugar control is really important. But what a lot of people don't know is that vitamin B12 is depleted by metformin. And then also we have uh, statin drugs here. One of my favorite topics. I could go on and on about statin drugs and what a hoax they are, but we'll save that for another time. They have been shown to deplete you of CoQ10. And so a lot of times people are taking their medicine and they're not realizing that these medicines are depleting vitamins from their system. This is really handy. I learned about this recently. There's an MD in Indiana named Dr. Jeffrey Glad, and he put together this website called mitaven.com. 
you enter your medication here, and he's got as many boxes as you've got pills. And he can actually help you with some of the combinations of drugs. So basically, you put all the drugs you take <coughs> into the box, and it populates a list of vitamins that these drugs have been shown in the research to deplete you of. And so just to test it out, of course, I, I plugged in metformin, and what, what vitamin popped up? B12. B12, mm. B12 exactly. So it tells you which what you're lacking or right how what what to you're take what to you're going to be uh, predisposed to be deficient in okay. based on what they know about the drugs. So really handy. It's completely free. You just go in, you type in your whatever you're taking, and it'll it'll populate a list of things. Um, I want to talk a little bit about fish oil. Fish oil is good for almost everything. I mean, if you've got it, fish oil is good for it. Good for your heart, your brain, your nerves. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, DHA is particularly important. So I told you that your brain is mostly fat. Most of that fat is DHA. And so that's this big long word here, docosahexaenic acid, abbreviated DHA. Okay, and, and uh, this study here, 24 week supplementation. So that's six months of supplementation with 900 milligrams of DHA a day, improved learning and memory function in, and this acu ac acronym means Alzheimer's related cognitive decline. Beneficial supplementation that supports cognitive health and aging. Here's another one. Um, this is about DHA and choline. And they showed that if they uh, supplemented the animals, mice in this case, but we know that all of our neurons in the animal kingdom are the same, right? We share the same structure as a snail, as a mouse, as we do. It's, it's how they're tied together that makes the difference, right? So in the mice, they fed them DHA and choline, and they grew more synapses. Those little things in the video that were crawling and growing, they, they grew more with this supplement. So, look at all that DHA. I can't even, I can't even get excited enough about this. Um, this is a sample we have up front. I, I take this one myself. Uh, calamari Omega Liquid. If you'll see right here, one teaspoon, one little bitty teaspoon, 800 milligrams of DHA. The thing I like about the uh, standard process fish oils is they, they do not mess with the oil to get the ratio they want. They find the animal that has the right ratio and they use that. So they don't mess with it. And that's something that I really like and that really sets them apart from pretty much any other uh, supplement company. So here's another one, another biggie with uh, Alzheimer's and nutrition, you have to get enough protein. And a lot of times with uh, older folks, they have trouble chewing, maybe they have bad teeth, it's hard to, to chew meat or digest meat, it can be a real problem. Um, interestingly enough, they, they also tried CoQ10 and green tea, and they found that those were effective but that the combination of both was even stronger, okay? So how do you know that you're getting enough protein? Well, you, you take your body weight and you divide it by two, and you multiply that by 0.8, and you have your daily recommended amount of protein. So to give you an example, we have a 150 pound lady, so we divide that by two and we get 75. We multiply it by eight, and we get 60 grams of protein. So a lot of elderly people and younger people are not getting enough protein, mm -hmm. and it's really important. Okay, so we're going to talk about turmeric now. Um, this is just a superstar in the herbal medicine world. I could I could literally do a whole seminar just on how good turmeric is. I, I will spare you guys that at this point. We'll keep it on on purpose here. Um, this. 
curcumin, this is the active ingredient, so to speak, in turmeric. And in this study, basically it saved brain cells. This amyloid beta, that is um, what starts to cause those tangles that we saw in the video. Um, and it starts to build up, and the more you have, the more you get. It's kind of a vicious cycle. So what I thought was interesting, um, it worked before or after, but it was better to catch it on the front end. And that's kind of where, you know, ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. That proves true over and over and over. So I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about this. This is a wonderfully powerful uh, brain health blend. This is from MediHerb in Australia. Uh, it's called Vitanox. We have rosemary, green tea, which we saw was a good thing, uh, turmeric, and grapeseed. All right, ginkgo. Who's heard of ginkgo? Everybody? Okay. Maybe you didn't know that there has been a lot of research done on ginkgo. This paper here reviews 29 randomized controlled trials. Supposedly the best evidence there is. They reviewed a number of them and over and over and over they showed that long-term administration of ginkgo improves brain health in people with Alzheimer's disease. Here's another one that I thought was really interesting. They compared ginkgo to denepazil, which is a new cutting edge pharmaceutical in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. They showed significant improvement with both treatments. Ginkgo had no dropouts due to side effects. And it was much cheaper. If, if any of you guys have ever had someone who's suffering from Alzheimer's that you were close to, you know that the pharmaceutical drugs are outrageously expensive. Maybe thousands of dollars a month. For what? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, some of these herbs are an investment, but when you look at the research that shows they're effective, and you look at the at the alternatives, they look like a, quite a bargain. Okay, so here's here's one uh, bacopa. This one's kind of near and dear to my heart. I took this uh, in preparation for my last national board exam, and <laughs> I credit it with helping me. Uh, be here today as a licensed doctor. So, uh, Bacopa is, this, this is really close to me. Um, this is another review. So they went over and they, they looked at a bunch of different research papers. And these are all the things that Bacopa did. Repaired damage from several different models of Alzheimer's disease. Reduced oxid oxidative damage. <coughs> increased brain-derived neurotrophic factor. <coughs> Prevented neuron death like you see in Parkinson's. <coughs> Reduced ischemic damage from stroke. Anti-seizure. Anti-exam anxiety similar to lorazepam. This is an antidepressant. Antidepressant. Anti-inflammatory. I mean, what, is, what does Bacopa not do? It's, it's really amazing. Um, here's some more research. I figured I'd just throw it in there. Uh, just because, like I said, I, I love Bacopa so much. Um, this is what it actually looks like. It's, it's quite a pretty flower. Um, been used in India to treat brain conditions for thousands of years. Okay, so not only do we have uh, modern scientific research papers backing it up, but we also have thousands of years of, of traditional knowledge uh, showing that it's effective. All right, here's another one that I really like. Ginseng. This is a picture of a ginseng root. Actually, three of them here. What What does it look like to you guys? Looks like a human, doesn't it? Well, it's interesting because the activity of ginseng is based on a whole body effect. It doesn't work on just one thing or another. It works on your whole body. No equivalent to its actions in contemporary conventional medicine. It just does too much. Uh, increases vitality and helps you withstand stress. Improves uh, cerebral, cerebral vascular deficit. That's uh, not enough blood to the brain. Promotes longevity, metabolism, and growth of cells. 
enhances insulin sensitivity. Hmm. So this is another piece of the puzzle here, helping us with diabetes. Um, and also protects against cancer in regular users. Okay, this one is dynamite. This is one of the most valuable substances on the planet. I mean, pound for pound, way more valuable than uh, some of the things that we would think as, as precious, like gold, for instance. So just a little bit of a note on, you know, I've been talking to you guys about a lot of herbs, and I've been talking to you guys about the research on herbs, and I just wanted to, to take a minute to explain a little bit of the difference between the herbs that I use and the herbs that we have from MediHerb and what you might find on the, on the shelf at Sprouts, okay? Um, MediHerb is an Australian company. In Australia, herbs and supplements are regulated just like pharmaceuticals, okay? So they have to meet the same standards as prescriptions. Um, everything that is on the label is actually in the bottle. And that's a big, that's a big, big part because it's not just what plant you use, it's what part of the plant. How did you package it? How did you process it? There's so many things that go into these and unfortunately there's a lot of unscrupulous people who have supplement companies and they're just, they're just selling complete garbage. I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, when I use Medier products, I know what I'm using, without a doubt. So, Kerry Bone, this is the gentleman who founded Medier over 30 years ago. He is probably the foremost expert in herbal medicine, and he literally wrote the book on herbal medicine. So, so he created this company for guys like me, who knew that there was a natural solution, but couldn't trust the products that they were getting on the shelf. So what I see on the label is what I know is in the bottle, and that's why this is the only herbal company that I use. So here's an example. Um, this is Herba Vital. It is a great blend for people with uh, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive decline, recovery after stroke. Uh, one thing that's really important is they, they give you the scientific name of what it is, and then they tell you how much of the active ingredient is in there. So for instance, we've all heard that red wine is good for our heart and that it's good as an antioxidant. One tablet of this Herbivital has the equivalent of 30 bottles of red wine. So I would challenge you <laughs> to get as much red wine uh, polyphenols from from grapes or from a, from a wine bottle in one night as one capsule of this stuff. It is extremely, extremely potent. Um, just, just to kind of give you guys an idea, you know, it has the resveratrol. This uh, milk thistle is good for cleaning your liver. Korean ginseng, which we already learned about, and ginkgo. So this blend is just fantastic for people struggling with this kind of thing. Okay, so I know that we've covered a lot and we've gone through a lot of information and you may or may not be feeling like this. I know when I learned this material, that's kind of how I felt. Um, but I'm going to break it down and kind of tie a nice bow on this and leave you, go, leave you to go with something that makes a little bit of sense, okay? So here is my grand schematic for Alzheimer's disease. Reversing cognitive decline. These are the things that you want to do. You have to manage the inflammation. You're going to find where the inflammation is coming from and you're going to kill it. You're going to go after it like your life depends on it because it probably does. You're going to manage your nutrition and herbs. You're going to make sure you get enough B vitamins, enough fish oil, brain food, ginkgo we talked about. I mean. I don't need to beat a dead horse here, okay? You gotta manage your blood sugar. Got to manage your blood sugar. And like I said before, the answer is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. It's very straightforward, and there are some proven steps that, that if you take, you will see results. And, and I'm not talking about a gimmick or a fad or, or something that's high dollar and crazy. 
What did your mama tell you? Eat your vegetables, right? There you go. Again, I'll, I'll emphasize that not everything is going to be necessary. Um, different people need different things. Everybody's a unique being. And so that's, like I said, that's where a guy like me comes in to do the detective work and to really figure out, okay, what's, what's relevant for this person? Okay? And then I added down here something that I, I didn't mention in the presentation, but I think is important. You want to add in some brain activities. Um, you know, they have some subscription companies, Lumosity, and some of these other things that you can do brain games on the computer. Um, crossword puzzles, word search, checkers, reading, you know, having a stimulating conversation about an important topic. These are all things that get your brain in gear and help you to grow those synapses. Okay? So, I know that's been a lot of material and I want to thank you guys uh, from the bottom of my heart for bearing with me and listening to, to what I had to say.